Danielle Allen. It is such a pleasure to be here with all of you today. A huge honor to have the chance to lead off this panel with a sort of brief keynote set of remarks. I am going to share some thoughts on philanthropic strategy for securing the healthy democracy we all deserve. Big, big goal, big goal. But let me back up and start by introducing myself and sharing a little bit about why I am doing work I do um, on democracy, what I'm trying to do. So I am a combination of a Harvard prof and democracy advocate. And when folks ask me what I work on, I always give the same answer, just democracy. Past, present, and future thereof with no question mark on the end of that. I come by that focus super honestly. It's a matter of basic family inheritance. So on my dad's side, my granddad helped found one of the first NAACP chapters in Northern Florida in the 40s. Thank you. That was super dangerous work, as I'm sure you all are, all are aware. I mean, lynchings were on the rise and so forth. He was taking his life into his hands. On my mom's side, my great-grandparents helped fight for women's right to vote in the early 20th century. So also awesome, exactly. My granddad was, or great-granddad rather, was an early ally, you could say. He marched with suffragettes here on Boston Common in 1917. And my great-grandmother ended up as president of the League of Women Voters in Michigan in the 30s. So a lot of civil society work there, you can hear. And those people that I come from, they were all people who were in one time or another told something was impossible. Social equality for African Americans in the South was impossible. Or women having the right to vote was impossible. And their answer was, no. Not only not impossible, but necessary. So the only question is how. So I come from how people. How are we going to do the things that feel impossible? And I was super lucky growing up. Then to grow up in a network of really civically engaged people, I also have to share that they were engaged across the political spectrum. So there's this one amazing year in my youth, 1992, when my aunt was running for Congress. She was on the ballot for Congress in the Bay Area in California for the Peace and Freedom Party. That's over here from where you guys are sitting. And at the same time, same year, my dad was running for Senate, for US Senate, from Southern California as a Reagan Republican. Okay? right-hand side of the spectrum. So we had amazing family dinner table conversations, holiday gatherings, back and forth. I mean, they really went at it. My dad was like super skinny, very professorial, always smoking with pipe smoke curling around his head. My aunt was a big woman, built like a Mack truck, huge belly laugh, gay, and they were just hammer and tongs. My dad arguing for market liberties, civic virtues, my aunt arguing for public sector investment across all segments of society, and experiments in living. And I was just a young person trying to figure it out, like which way does this thing go? As I watched them, it became clear to me two things. The first was that for all of their arguments, they actually had a shared purpose, a common purpose, I always like to say. They had a shared purpose, a common purpose, which was just empowerment. They saw empowerment and therefore democracy, self-government, as the bedrock for human thriving and well-being. They had huge disagreements about how to achieve that empowerment for themselves, their families, and their communities, but they shared that common purpose. They also shared a commitment to each other as human beings. For all that they disagreed, it was always clear that they would always have each other's back. And they always did, and they never broke the bonds of love. So that was my school of democracy, this sense that empowerment is the bedrock for human thriving. We can have huge arguments about how we actually get there, but we always hold sacred the human dignity of the person in front of us. So I was lucky, you can tell, to have been raised in that kind of environment. And as a young person, I did take the value of democracy for granted. And it wasn't really until I was watching my own generation come up in the world that the question of the value of democracy got a lot more complicated for me. So my parents' generation, everybody pretty much moved up. That same granddad was a fisherman. 
his kids were small business owners and professors. On the other side, it was factory workers to accountants and so on. But my generation has lived through something quite different. I call what we've lived through the great pulling apart. So here I stand, able to mosey down in the middle of the day, work week from a great university where I've got a role as a tenured faculty member to be with all of you, not work in a second job, have that flexibility in the middle of my day. Right? This is a role of incredible privilege that I have. Like, forget Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or whoever it is people think has the most privilege. Like, tenured faculty member, thank you very much. I know it, I definitely know it. And I've got a brother who's a corporate executive. At the same time, I've got cousins who are not with us any longer. So people I ran around in the street playing football with, age mates, playmates, and they're not here for all of the hardest things we are troubled with in our society. Substance use disorder, incarceration, homicide. And I lost my youngest cousin, Michael, in 2009, and that was a real life-turning point moment for me, and I realized that this thing my family was living through, where some of us were up here, and others were trapped in really dark and difficult circumstances, well, that's basically what our whole country has lived through over the 50-plus years of my lifetime. So the 50-plus years of my life, like those years, if you look at the, the graphs that chart the rise of income inequality, wealth inequality, polarization, incarceration, it's the same 50-plus years. All right, so what my family has experienced, we have all experienced. And so I, I started asking myself, how can we change these dynamics? Because, you know, democracy, yes, we love the ideals of freedom and equality, but democracy is not supposed to be abstractly valuable. We embrace those ideals of freedom and equality because when we do, they give us a society that makes it possible for every generation, one after the next, to do a bit better than the previous. And for a whole cohort, a whole generational cohort, to come up together. So that was my question, then how can we change the dynamics so that our democracy can actually deliver on the promise of democracy? So that's what I've been doing since that point in time, and immediately after my cousin's death, I started spending most of my time first actually in criminal justice reform, but I quickly came to realize that even where we had cross-partisan, common sense solutions to things, it was really hard to get them through, especially at the federal level because of governance dysfunction. And I know our governance situation is really bad right now, and I know you all know that, but the truth is it was already really bad a decade ago. I don't know if you remember, but in 2013, Congress had an approval rating of 9%. That was my red alert moment. It's like, ah, eh, first branch of government. We, the people, approve of our own voice at the rate of 9%. That means it's basically broken. So I've been working on what I call democracy renovation ever since for the past decade. And so what I want to do for the rest of my time with you before we bring up a fantastic panel is to talk with you about what the work of democracy renovation might be, might mean from the perspective of philanthropy. And to do that, I have a couple of slides. Let's see if I can figure out where I'm supposed to point this. There we go. Start with the keep you up at night fact. When I think about the work of democracy renovation, there's one fact above all that keeps me up at night. And it is this portrait of change across generations. For the generational cohort born before World War II, roughly 70% considered it, or still consider it, essential to live in a democracy. For millennials and younger, so early 40s and below, so not that young really anymore, right? It's not quite 30% that consider it essential to live in a democracy. And it's very simple. We can't have a democracy if people don't want a democracy. So when we think about this, it means we have a very basic way of thinking about what it means to actually do democracy renovation work. We're trying to get back to a place where there is a supermajority committed to democracy a power-sharing supermajority. So not supermajorities of yesteryear where one group thought it was okay to dominate another group, however you want to think about it, but a genuinely power-sharing supermajority for democracy. But for any democracy to be stable, there has got to be a supermajority of its members who consider it essential to live in it. That means a big cross-ideological supermajority. 
that's what you got to have to have a healthy democracy. So what does it mean to ask a supermajority to commit to the idea of democracy? My team at an organization called Partners in Democracy works with something we call the 360 degree democracy standard. And I'm not going to go through this in full detail, but we talk, of course, about the right to vote and the need to protect that. But the right to vote doesn't actually get you anything if you don't have competitive elections. And you may have noticed that, for example, 85% of our congressional elections aren't even competitive any longer because of gerrymandering. You can go through the list, but we just don't actually have that much in the way of real competition in our political system anymore. So there's a whole issue of needing to protect the right to run in competitive elections. But even that doesn't get you anything if you can't see what your elected officials are doing while they're in office, or if you can't really follow flows of money. So there's also a sort of right to see and shape your community. And all of the issues with journalism and local news deserts are really implicated in that third category. The whole thing, though, has to be anchored by a culture of democratic commitment. And what does that mean? A couple of basic things. A commitment to constitutional democracy and self-government. A commitment to universal participation, inclusion, and full power sharing. And a few other things about how we all fulfill our roles and responsibilities. But above all, that commitment to constitutionalism, that commitment to full inclusion. So happy to talk more about that later if you want, but now what I want to do is really think about, well, what is that picture of a goal of building a super, a, a super majority committed to democracy? What would that look like for philanthropy? Partly, we have to think about, is this really possible, Danielle, the super majority you talk about? You know, how would we know it was possible, and, then, and how would we begin to think about bringing that out, bringing it, bringing it to light? There's lots of different ways of pointing to its existence. I like to point out the fact that all over the country, in states, we do achieve supermajority votes for ballot propositions. For example, cannabis legalization, or in Florida, restoring voting rights to people with completed service of their felony convictions, or in Mississippi, getting a new state flag without emblems of the Confederacy. All of these depended on people forging coalitions across ideological lines. And in all of them, you see an American people committed to ideals of fairness, inclusion, sticking up for the person getting the short end of the stick. So we know that there is potential out there for a supermajority oriented around those core values of basic democratic commitment. But what's keeping that supermajority for really coming, from really coming to light for all of us? In the early 20th century, there was a sociologist named Michel who had a theory about the iron law of oligarchy. The basic idea was that every single human organizational form always tends over time towards being captured by some sort of small minority that is doing power seeking, rent seeking, and things like that. Different kinds of capture are possible, but that was his view. He was so fatalistic and pessimistic about this that he just joined Mussolini, went all in for fascism, all right? That's the wrong answer. <laughs> okay. So yes, I actually agree with Michel that there is something like a kind of iron law of oligarchy that works, where there's always efforts to capture the institutions of a democracy, to gain control. However, the job is to figure out how always to undo that, always to open up the possibilities for self-government again. Now, I have a little bit of uh, activities for you. We're going to talk about a couple of examples of capture that we're currently experiencing that we have to address. So spot the difference. You know what these two scenes are. 250,000 people gathered on the mall for Martin Luther King's March on Washington. Roughly speaking, about 2,000 storming the Capitol on January 6th. What differences do you spot? You can shout really loud from your tables. One or two differences you might spot. What's that? Say it again. They're still alive on the right. Yeah, they're still alive. Cell phones, I hear. Say again. Flags. Thank you. Okay, got it. Thank you. Flags, cell phones on the right. A lot of differences here. So those 250,000 people, how do they get there? Door knocking, phone calls. 
face-to-face organization in churches, 250,000 people showing up on the mall in Washington, that is a huge social movement. Huge, all right? Nuts and bolts, face-to-face organizing in communities around very serious purpose. On the right, we do see flags. We see a cell phone smack dab in the middle of that picture. I don't know if you can spot it. That there's a flash mob, friends, all right? That is not reflective of deep organizing. That is reflective of the power of social media, the social media environment, which has completely transformed our political landscape. And it has made it possible for small groups of people to capture the structure, activities, functioning of in our entire institutional system. Okay? Really important difference in scale between those two things to recognize, and important to recognize the impact of social media supporting coordination of people with extreme views. Last difference, I didn't hear anybody shout it out, but nonviolent, violent. Okay, let's not forget that one. All right. Can you identify this case? What city in America is this in 2016? Houston, so good try in Charlottesville. On the right-hand side, you have a group of people who are protesting, in their words, Islamofascism. On the left-hand side, you have counter-protesters literally across the street protesting Islamophobia. But you'll notice their rhetoric is just as violent on that banner. Both groups are there because of Russian Facebook groups. All right? The capture that we are experiencing isn't just something that's coming inside our own borders. It's not just something that is supported and driven by social media. It is also the work of external adversaries, both state actors and groups of extremists around the globe. All right? This is all documented. If you want to know more, ask me more. So the important point is that this picture provides an anatomy of our current politics. There is a potential supermajority in the American people with a set of shared values, core democratic commitments, including to nonviolence. But we're fractured, and we're getting pressured by a radicalized minority and by the global context which is empowering that radicalized minority, and then media pressures, both the absence of healthy media in lots of places and highly polarized media generally that are giving us all narrative frames. Okay. So how do we deal with this? Now, I know this slide is almost impossible to see, so I apologize for that. So first of all, we do have to have a bright line. That's what that yellow line is, saying, OK, as members of a democracy, we are committed to universal inclusion, a sense of belonging in our communities for everybody, constitutionalism. That's also that nonviolent commitment. And we think, though, that on on this side of the line, that is about building a supermajority for democracy that brings together our movement progressives for democracy, our democracy renovators living in the center of the political spectrum, our pro-democracy center-right constitutionalists, for instance. There is space for all of these people with different perspectives to come together in support of the project of democracy. We have a job to do to shrink the space outside that supermajority to the smallest possible bit. And everybody should be given the chance to come back, for sure, right? Everybody should be given the chance to come back. Some may not. Even in that high water mark that I started with, 70% of the pre-World War II generation thinking democracy essential, it was 70%, right? So you're never going to get everybody, right? But you've got to do work of de-radicalization and depolarization of the media to shrink that category as far as we can. And then we've got to do work to pull that coalition together to to do the job of protecting and renovating our democracy. So what does it mean to protect and renovate? And I promise I'm almost done. Protection, election integrity. I know that's turned into a bad word, but that's not the fault of the word. Election integrity is a good idea. It means getting election administration right. We need to reclaim that concept and do right by it. People have to trust their elections and their institutions. We do have to do that work. Leadership norms. Elected officials who stand up for those core commitments of democracy that I started with. Bridging projects, civic education, working on our civic culture so that people are reconnected to their civic experience, power, and responsibility. And a healthy information ecosystem. 
all of those things are components of protecting democracy. But what about renovating it? To renovate it, we need to get to a place where our institutions are actually responsive again to ordinary people, where we don't see things captured by the sort of minority components of parties. The truth of the matter is that very few members of the electorate actually matter any longer for picking our elected officials. Things are decided so much in primaries in so many places with low turnout. There's a very small percentage of the electorate that's actually delivering our elected officials to us. So how do we get responsive representation, full power sharing? A lot of people are working on important reforms. They include ending party primaries. I really like to talk about that one, so maybe we can during the panel. <laughs> Ranked choice voting, full voter access, like same day voter registration, for instance. Deliberative and citizen assemblies, direct participation in our decision making processes, and approaches to addressing campaign finance issues as well. All right, so you put those together, you've got a set of protecting and renovating action steps that might be taken. Now this is a lot, and it's all overwhelming. The good news is we don't all have to do all of it. We just all need to know what lane we want to be in, and then we need to be in conversation with people who are in the other lanes. So I like to say that we all ought to have a diversified portfolio when we think about our democracy work, whether that's personal or institutional. You may not all be in a position where you can work on candidates, but if you do work on candidates, well, let's do work on democracy support of candidates specifically. And let's have a bucket that's about democracy protection. Let's have a bucket that's about renovation. And here I've set up this portfolio as if it's 30, 30, 30, or a third each. That doesn't have to be the allocation. You could allocate across those buckets differently. But let's have a democracy portfolio. That's my proposal to all of you as philanthropists, that there should be a way of thinking about your investments that is specifically aligned with a strategy for securing healthy democracy in the 21st century. I can say a lot more about success cases that I see working underneath each of these buckets, but I'll leave that for another day. What I really want to leave you with is the idea that there is a strategic vision for how we can secure the health of our democracy. It is about protecting our democracy on the one hand. It is also about redesigning our institutions through renovation on the other hand. And we do need people to pitch in across all of these buckets of work. Thank you very much for your time. My name is Kristen Campbell. I have the honor of leading an organization called PACE, Philanthropy for Active Civic Engagement. And I also have the honor of moderating today a panel of how people um, to help respond and react to and build upon some of the provocations that, that Dr. Allen has given us. Um, I want to start by just saying a, a couple of things that I hope we can all bring to the spirit of this conversation. At PACE, we often talk about how democracy work is not just about what you do, but it's about how you do it and with whom. And so I really want to um, invite us all to model that in the discussion today. I hope we will find some areas of agreement. I actually hope in a little bit more that we might find some areas of disagreement um, and be able to lean into those. Grace kicked us off last night by asking us to be comfortable with having our own views challenged. And I hope we'll be able to find some of those creative tensions um, in our dialogue today. She asked us to, and I will invite all of us to, um, say what we think, listen generously, and assume best intent. And I love the idea of assuming best intent. I might actually say, even better, make no assumptions at all. <laughs> and let's see what, what we can uncover together. Um, oh, I also want to, before we get started, just double click on a couple of things that, that Daniel, I think you brought really powerfully um, into the conversation today that really underpin the way that I wanted to structure this uh, conversation today. The first is that for uh, democracy, excuse me, um, for democracy to be successful, we have to have the widest spectrum of people possible. We really need to be thinking about democracy as being about more than our politics 
and our politics as being about more than our partisanship. And so I hope that's something we can ground in today's conversation. Also, plus one, two, you do not have to be a democracy funder to have a democracy portfolio. To care about and be invested in and dependent on the health of democracy and civil society. Um, Danielle laid out a really thoughtful and provocative framework for us to think about. I'm going to invite some of my colleagues um, to jump in and react to that. I'm going to ask some questions to some colleagues, and Danielle, I invite you to jump in along the way as well. Um, with me are Crystal Haling of the Libra Foundation, Sarah Cross of Stand Together, and Stephen Heinz of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. So we have only about 30 minutes for this part of the discussion. I want us to be able to move swiftly but thoughtfully. Um, and so I want to start with a little bit of a lightning round for the three of you. When you hear the term democracy renovation, what's the first thing that pops into your mind? And what's the first thing that you would prioritize if you were the architect or the contractor um, designed, charged with designing a democracy renovation plan? Crystal, why don't we start with you? Uh, thank you, and it's wonderful to be here with everyone. Um, you know, I have such respect for Danielle and for the work that she's doing. And so what I would say is I love the idea of a democracy um, renovation. And what pops into my mind is uh, kind of the concomitant democracy revival, right? I think the renovation starts in the house up here. I'm kind of about the revival. You know, when you go to the revival tent, everybody's in. You get a little sweaty. Everybody's talking to everybody else. That's kind of what I think of is what we do at Libra Foundation. What we're really interested in is funding the community organizing, funding the on-the-ground work of people actually knocking on doors, talking to neighbors, that kind of work. So I think that the, the democracy renovation and the revival kind of go hand in hand, and that's what it comes to me to my mind. Sarah? I can just I can echo the thanks for having me, and sorry in advance for my scratchy voice. I've got a, a lung condition, but glad to, glad to be here. Um, love the metaphor of, of renovation, and my, my brain goes straight to the, uh, the fixer-upper mid-century modern house that I inherited, and it's been <laughs> draining my bank account since I, <laughs> since I got it. Uh, and I think it's actually a decent, uh, decent metaphor for what we're trying to do with American democracy, because you know, it, was, it was built on a radical idea. It, it uh, expressed itself beautifully. It's worth preserving and it takes a ton of work forever and will always take a ton of work. Um, and, and, you know, stretching the house metaphor as far as it can possibly go, those renovations are only as good as the, the foundation. And I think we're at a moment where we have to shore up that, that foundation. And, and for us, that means uh, working on the culture and strengthening the social, social fabric uh, in every community in, in America. And I know we'll get into that more later. Great, Stephen? Well, I too want to thank everybody for having me back at CEP. I had the pleasure of being the board chair of CEP many, many years ago, and I have enormous respect for this organization, and it's great to see so many old friends. I also want to say that I'm honored to be the gender diversity on this panel. <laughs> um, I'm committed to gender diversity. Um, and it's also a great honor and pleasure to be here with Danielle. Danielle and I had the, the great privilege of co-chairing a national commission on democracy organized by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences just down the street. And we issued the, I think, very important and still very useful report called Our Common Purpose in June of 2020. Um, I use a slightly different language than Danielle, and she and I have talked about this a lot. I like all, all of the, revival is a good one, renovation is a good one. The, the word I use is reinvention. Because I think uh, we are at a place, in part because of the enormous change, the demographic and sociological change in our country, and also because of the information ecosystem changes, which are truly radical, and Danielle pointed out how radical they really are, that we need to, yes, renovate, we need to revive, but we also need to reinvent. We need to make democracy really relevant for the very different conditions of the 21st century, especially in a country as large as ours, that aspires to be a mass, multi-ethnic, multi-racial, genuine democracy. We've never quite achieved that. And I don't think we're gonna do it just by renovating alone. I think we need innovation and reinventing some things to project us forward into that future. 
talk a little bit about the role of philanthropy in particular. Um, often as an organization that advocates for philanthropy's role in democracy, we sometimes get a little bit of a like, well, what about the separation of church and state? And is that for us? And, and what's the role of government? And so I think there are lots of fair questions that come up um, that as brilliant as Daniel's framework was that really invite us to say like, why is, why is that philanthropy's job? And so I'd love for each of you to kind of reflect on that. What can philanthropy do in democracy, renovation, revival, reinvention, and relevance. Uh, what can philanthropy do that others can't, particularly government? And what should philanthropy not do? What is absolutely not our role? Stephen, let's start with you this time and work backwards. Well, of course, our, our role is not to get engaged in partisan politics. That's, that's clear, that's obvious. Um, I think our role, though, is to help every American understand that they need to be part of the supermajority and that we ourselves need to be part of the supermajority. I don't think any philanthropic institution can sit on the sidelines when our democracy is facing the threats that it's currently facing. I would say democracy renovation or reinvention or revival is the job of all of us. And I challenge everybody in this room to make it part of your work explicitly because what philanthropy can do is support research, support innovation, support mobilization, and build the supermajority we're gonna to need to both protect and preserve and reinvent this democracy for this century. So completely agree that, that philanthropy has a role to play in everything that, that Stephen just described. Um, you know, I, I, I would maybe act, uh, add just the field building component is, is so important. Philanthropy has such an ability to look across all of the, the different sectors of, of society and, and help build something that will last as an area of focus. Because I think we're all saying, as much as we're in an acute moment right now, there's never going to be a day where democracy and liberal institutions don't need defense. So let's make sure that we have the, the connective tissue between social change leaders that it's gonna take to do that in perpetuity. My caution I would offer what philanthropy shouldn't do as passionate as we are about defending democracy and as much as we should go full force out into the world to, to do that, we shouldn't make that mean that we're telling communities how to do that from the, the top down and telling them how to express that, that commitment to democracy. And you know, I, I don't know that it looks like, it, or it necessarily has to look like telling communities and people who are dealing with sort of really pressing issues related to their ability to feed their families and, and the like, that democracy needs to be their number one issue. Uh, but rather that there are ways that they can contribute to civic life in a way that, that makes a healthy democracy and a diverse society possible. Yeah, I would love to um, circle back to one of Danielle's slides, which was the slide around January 6th. And, um, you know, the great organizer, Grace Lee Boggs, would always say it's really important to know what time it is in the clock of the world. Um, and the clock of the world is telling us that we don't have a lot of time. We just had the hottest summer on the history of this planet. We, are, we, we recognize that we are seeing these divisions in our society that are really cracking that foundation that Elise just talked about. And I think some of the things that philanthropy can do is to really step up with a sense of urgency. So we need to declare full-throatedly that we believe that it is possible for us to be funders and supporters of the creation of a multiracial democracy with an economy that works for everyone, for everyone. We do not need to have small goals like we just don't wanna have division. We don't need to have small goals like we're just gonna pick a few of those specific renovations. We actually need to have the full big goal that we're going to create a multiracial democracy. And what does that mean, though, too, for the work that we do? We've actually got to fund the practice of democracy. Democracy is a practice, not a product, right? So we have to fund people who are actually engaging in it. And we have to recognize and name that some people have been purposely excluded from participating in that practice of democracy. And we're going to fund those organizations that are reaching out to those populations because they have to first be convinced that their vote might matter, 
They have to then be convinced and shown that they can actually register to vote. And then they have to be part of a, of a community of people that are all rowing in a similar direction to try and achieve some real material changes. So we've got to actually make sure too, as Aunt Danielle pointed out to us earlier, that there are actual material gains connected to the act of participating in government and in, in, in our democracy. So I think those are some of the things that we need to do. We need to push back a little bit against um, a lot of the commentary that we're hearing that government can't do anything. Because it's a lot of that sense of there's nothing I can do that actually has so many Americans sitting on the sidelines. And finally, I think it's important for us to be able to be honest and truthful in naming names about some of the forces that have brought us to this point. It's not that we just happen to be divided. There are people of great wealth and of a particular point of view who have chosen to divide this country. And so then we actually have to know who we're working with and who we're working against. Now I'm not suggesting that we should out outline some people as being enemies. But I am saying that it is important when we sit down at tables of togetherness and work with philanthropy, that we know that we're actually in relationship with good actors, with people who do, as Danielle said, actually support democracy, actually support a multiracial society, and do actually have real integrity around believing in the humanity of each and every fellow American. So I think those are some of the things that we can do in philanthropy. And I'm really excited because I see a lot of people in this crowd who I know are doing some of that work and I'm looking forward to the exchange. Christine, can I just add yeah, one, one, one thought about this? Because um, Crystal has identified something that I think is important, but it's very, very challenging, which is you know, we, we could think of the, uh, of the Hippocratic Oath, you know, first do no harm. And we are living in such a hyper-polarized political environment that I think we in philanthropy who engage in this have to be conscious of the fact that at times we contribute to the polarization. And maybe there are moments when that's necessary, but maybe there are moments when we do it when it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to ask ourselves that question as we make these judgments. That's something that we hear a lot at PACE. Danielle. If I, if I could jump in on that for a second. Um, I think in a sense that's what, this is the hard issue I was trying to get at with my particularly ugly slide. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I'm not very good at graphic design in case you hadn't noticed. But the, the slide with the yellow bar um, and then the sort of supermajority. Um, and we do have to draw a bright line and say there, there is a thing that counts as being democracy supportive. And we have to be realistic and recognize that not everybody is going to join us on this side of the line. Um, but by the same token, I do think um, sort of beginning with a kind of approach where the expectation is, in fact, though, the number of people who can join us on that side of the line is a very broad cross ideological supermajority, um, is the necessary approach for coalition building to do the work that we need to do. Mm -hmm. And that is a bit of a shift of frame, I think, from how we have often um, thought about the sort of landscape of, you know, in, in Crystal, in your language, like knowing you know, who's with us and who's against us. I'm, I'm offering a different mental model for that exercise, and I'm offering a different mental model in the hopes that it does actually make it possible for us to do the, the really serious democracy work, which, again, does have to get to building a supermajority if a democracy is going to be sustainable and legitimate over time. Really Can I have, add to that? Oh, sorry, what? We're just going to really quickly add to yep, that. But I know, I know you've got questions to work through, but I, I just think this is so important uh, because I think the other thing we can't forget is that we tend to be really bad at actually guessing what the other side really believes. And, and we tend to, across the spectrum, across, across beliefs, especially with respect to ideology, overestimate the extremism of the other. And then even within those, uh, those bodies of, of people that are expressing extreme views, because we are so deeply wired to conform as political and ideological tribes, we've got a tendency to say something, even if we don't believe it, because we think that we must in order to avoid getting kicked out of our, our party or our partisan community. And that's a phenomenon that you see even with respect to democratic norms and institutions. I mean, we've, we've done a lot of looking at, at the right specifically on this, and, and there's just a tremendous, tr 
tremendous gap between the people who, for instance, just as one example, actually believe the big lie versus will say when asked, especially in a public polling context, that they believe it because they think that's the, the shibboleth that they must draw uh, in order to, to remain a part of their, their community. So I, I think just thinking with a more open mind about who is actually willing to be on board, and I know we'll get to this more in the, the conversation, when you actually dig into what Americans really believe across the political spectrum, there's tremendous alignment and overlap, fortunately, with respect to, to democratic and liberal, liberal institutions. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm really glad that you raised that because it also, there's a session in the block right after this about bridging divides, coming together across difference and understanding um, people better. Danielle, I wanna invite you to um, respond to the question of, you gave us a really good framework of what is philanthropy's role. I wanna hear you articulate what should we not be doing and Crystal, I think we missed that in your response too. So I wanna come back to you on that. But Danielle and then Crystal, what should we not be doing? I, I appreciate um, the question, and actually, if just to say one other thing first about philanthropy's role, it was interesting to me in your responses that um, it, it, was, it was not surprising to me that there was a kind of concern about getting engaged in partisan things, and I would agree that that's a sort of a thing philanthropy shouldn't do. But it was interesting to me that another concern might be, oh, but isn't it government's job to take care of these things and not philanthropy? That is, is genuinely surprising to me, actually, um, as an orientation, if it, if it is an orientation that characterizes the work. Um, and I suppose the reason it's surprising to me is because democracy is self-government. It emerges from civil society, ultimately. So we, the members of civil society, are the architects of our political institutions. Philanthropy is, there's no better example of what is a set of civil society organizations than philanthropy. So I find it honestly genuinely surprising if philanthropy wouldn't see itself as having responsibility um, for the political institutions that grow out of our civil society structure. And what should we not do? And in terms of not doing, um, I mean, you know, um, on this question of partisanship, my, I have, I often experience that 501c3s, organizations that are 501c3s or supporting 501c3s, um, think that if, but folks are working on things that um, sort of have kind of controversial issues attached to them or something like that, that that in itself is partisan. And I think that's a misunderstanding of what it means to be partisan. What it means to be partisan is like to work with a party, to work with candidates of a specific party. So what I always say to people is, just make sure you're sharing your ideas with everybody. Invite everybody to the table, people from both parties, if you're sharing ideas that belong in the policy landscape. You're not partisan, you've got good ideas. If they take it and do partisan things with it, like that's their business, all right? But as long as you are sharing your good ideas with everybody, even if your good ideas happen to have a kind of controversial valence or flavor of some sort, you're not actually being partisan. So I would encourage you to, to, to avoid falling into the trap of sort of misperceiving what counts as partisan. Crystal, did you want to weigh in on what we shouldn't do? Yeah, I do. I actually want to also just say that I think it's interesting um, you know, the old joke where there's like, you know, the two fish that are, you know, like swimming past each other and one of them says, you know, how's the water? And the other one like mm -hmm. says, you know, what's, what's water? water? Um, you know, I think that there is a level at which we have to acknowledge that because we work in philanthropy, we're kind of swimming in the waters of privilege. Um, you know, it's just very hard to see when we're not just everything is kind of moving along in a particular way with people uh, who are well-educated, people who we've gone to school with, people who have a certain amount of money and their kids go to certain schools. So to me, the bridging and the divide that we often see, we so quickly move to the thing of, you know, the left and the right. Um, and the, the divide that I'm really interested in us in philanthropy breaking through and really trying something different is when we are actually centering people who are most impacted in communities, people who don't actually look and dress like us, people whose day-to-day -day experience is of having a hard time making ends meet, people who have family members who are getting in and out of prison, people who have kids who have drug addiction. 
Um, I think it's really exciting, and one of the things we've done with the Democracy Frontlines Fund, which is an initiative that the Libra Foundation created, is to bring together 15 different foundations, most of us, you know, kind of most of which are sort of mainstream foundations, you know, Mark MacArthur, um, Schmidt Family Foundation, Sobrato, these are not radical foundations, um, but we spend a lot of our time talking to people from communities. I think that is actually a harder divide for us to bridge in philanthropy, and one that we often is a huge blind spot for us. So I think the thing that I'm, I'm less interested in is being, you know, the thing that philanthropy is not really helpful, is to say we need to have a philanthropy table in which we've got um, you know, somebody, you know, sprinkle in a couple of Republicans, sprinkle in a couple of Democrats, it's a stir and you got a democracy, right? That's not really what we're talking about here. We've actually got to swim against the current of where we are, which is that privilege just sits there, that we talk to people who sound and act and look just like us, but actually try to bridge some divides with people who are really not even part of this democratic experiment right now at all and see what they have to say. So Stephen, I want to come to you next. Um, Danielle might be surprised about philanthropy's reticence or hesitance to engage in democracy. I know that you are not <laughs> because you are out, you know, you use your voice in your platform a lot to be advocating for more philanthropic investment in democracy. What do you hear from your peers when you are asking them to invest? What are the concerns, the barriers, and how might we address them? Well, I'm certainly not surprised, but I am frustrated. Um, you know, I, and I haven't looked at the data recently, but a couple of years ago, a, a group of foundations commissioned what was then the Foundation Center, now Candid, to actually do some data searching about this. And the data that they came up with was shocking, that if you broadly define philanthropic work in support of a healthy democracy, the annual giving by U.S. foundations was 2% of total giving. And this was, this was not before the current democracy crisis, it was in the midst of this crisis. And I don't think the data has changed that much. And I think the reason is, frankly, risk aversion on the part especially of boards. Boards look at this stuff, and Daniel has kind of indicated this, and they say, oh my God, this is such a hot button issue, it's too partisan, it's too, too dangerous, too risky, um, when they don't really understand that legally, we can, we can do advocacy, we can do education, we can engage on political issues as long as we are not engaging with individual candidates or individual parties and supporting their aims. So I think it's risk aversion. I think there's a second layer which is skepticism that you can actually do anything. You know, there, there is a lot of um, democracy despair. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that's an infection that is holding people back from saying, well, if, if, um, if we're in despair, we need some therapy and we need to invest in that therapy. Um, and I think that's part of the problem. I think uh, a lot of foundations have a hard time recognizing that the work is both mechanical at one level, the wiring and the plumbing of the renovation, but it is also fundamentally cultural and the cultural work is, is complex, it's subtle, it's nuanced, it's very long term. But if we don't do the cultural work, and Sarah has alluded to this too, that's the foundation. If we don't do that cultural work, all the institutional reforms we might make will stand on very soft ground and will crumble when pushed. So I think these are some of the barriers that I hear from people, but we, we have to get over it. We have to do this. My metaphor that I often use when I talk about that is that democracy is not a piece of the pie that sits along the other pieces is, that we care about, it's the pan yeah. that holds exactly. the pie together. Exactly. Danielle, were you gonna I mean, jump in? It just, it just, <laughs> just, oh, the crust, it, okay, we can debate this later. I mean, just one, one last, and this is, this is probably obvious, and I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm coming across as preaching here, but you know, whether you're a, an environmental funder whether you're a funder in the arts, whether you're interested in education reform, there really isn't any endeavor of philanthropic activity that doesn't rely on a healthy democracy in order to really make progress. And so even if you are narrowly focused 
you can make democracy part of that focus because it's essential to accomplishing your mission. Sarah, did you just, want to jump in? Yeah, just add something to that. I, I, uh, I want to be very careful with the, the point that you're bringing up about despair, because I think we can both acknowledge what a critical moment that we're in, acknowledge that we're in a tipping point where democracy is as threatened as it, as it is in reality, and still cast a realistically optimistic vision about what we can accomplish right now and that philanthropy can catalyze in terms of accomplishment. And it's when I look at the the culture that I get especially optimistic. Like a couple just recent studies I'd, I'd point everyone to. I mean, I think most people in the room have seen the more in common hidden tribes work that, that indicates that we've got more in common than what divides us. But take a look at the American Aspirations Index from, uh, from a think tank called Populous. When you ask Americans to reveal what highest aspirations they hold for the country, there's tremendous agreement on eight out of the 10 top aspirations. Uh, if, if what we think is so much the problem here is that you know Americans have left civic life and have ceded the playing field to a fortunately still small minority but extreme minority, then there's a lot of, of hope in getting Americans back into the, the game and, and that in doing so we can transform the culture. The, the last bit of hope that I'd offer, a follow-up to the American Aspirations Index was a, a survey on the American dream. What, how Americans define the American dream. It's not fame, it's not fortune, it's not material gains, it's actually living a life of purpose and meaning, which they define as getting into their communities, solving problems together, being in connection with each other. And that's actually, of all of the aspirations Americans name for their life, at the highest, it's shared across every, every demographic, and Americans report that they're not living into it. So you've got a lot of common ground in terms of areas of collaboration, You've got people wanting to live a life of meaning. You don't have to convince them that they need to do this. They just need permission to go do it. And, and they're hungry to do so. And you can give them the opportunity to do so. You're working in communities. You're working in opportunities to go do civics and live out the life at the community level that, that Crystal was describing. And if we can do that, we can transform immediately. So I'm glad that you touched on this because I had a question that I wanted to ask about narratives and what seem to be the two dominant narratives in the democracy space right now. One is we're not as divided as, as we think and these problems are solvable. Another one is the house is on fire. We are one bad move away from losing democracy entirely and it will take at least one, if not two generations to even have the possibility of getting it back. So you've spoken to one. I'm curious if anybody wants to speak to the other one or present an alternate narrative that you wish that philanthropy was embracing and pushing forward that maybe held up the complexities of these realities a little Just bit more. ever so briefly end my thought and say that yeah. both can be true. And the problem is that everyone believes that everyone else is more extreme and that we're about to go off that cliff and so they're not doing the things that can save us. Narratives can, can help them know that they're in community with people who believe similarly if we can give them that permission structure. Yeah, Danielle, did you want to jump in? And then I want to come to Crystal. Great, no, thank you. Um, I want to second that, I mean, both, I would say, are true at the same time and the reason I shared the examples of the state level ballot propositions with supermajority votes is because that's one way we can get a portrait of who we are as a people, right? Where we are able to form big coalitions to do things that are upholding basic values of fairness and inclusion. That portrait we get from state ballot propositions is a very different portrait that we, than we get from looking at our national politics, our federal politics. And so you have to ask yourself a question, you know, how can we, the people, have this capacity to be a supermajority or have the common ground that Sarah's describing and yet see ourselves and our elected official like so totally at each other's throats. And in my view, the answer to that question is like, that's where our failing institutions, our sort of problematic incentive structures created by our institutions have trapped who we are as a people in a system that is incapable of being responsive and doing problem solving work. And to make it this very, very concrete, you know, I would say that the basic problem is unintended consequences of reforms to our party system in the middle of the 20th century that have turned our, our political parties into quasi-state agencies, getting state funding through the, the primary system, no longer private civic associations. And so regardless of how many members they lose, that does not affect the degree of power they have over our institutions. And as they lose members, 
and as with other things, gerrymandering as well and so forth, fewer and fewer people can actually decide the outcomes of the party process, you have a sort of locked in place, sort of structure of polarization there operating at the institutional level, even though that is not actually where we the people are. And so the question is like, how do we spring ourselves from that trap? <coughs> That's why we have to get rid of party primaries. Okay. <laughs> I, I totally agree with everything that Daniel just said. And, and, I, and I also um, really appreciate, um, you know, at least sort of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Sarah. Okay. I'm so I sorry. know her too. <laughs> uh, um, I really appreciate you complexifying things and, and talking about there not being a binary um, and that, you know, both things are true. Um, I also want to just kind of throw in a little bit of other thinking here on this. Um, you know, Al Gore, uh, who, as you all know, has been a great environmental supporter, um, just recently did a new TED Talk. And in his new TED Talk, he says, I was really wrong about a lot of things. And uh, one of the main things that he says he was wrong about was that he spent so many decades believing that if he got at the table with all of the environmentalists, all the conservationists, and the oil and gas industry, that we would eventually be able to come to some agreement about how we were gonna move forward. And he's now saying, I was completely wrong about that. Because what I didn't understand is that the oil and gas industry decided that it wanted to be at every table and asked to be at every table and said that they wanted to be at every table to find a solution. And now we're understanding from the documents that are coming out from the oil and gas industry that all of that was just part of the ruse to deny climate change and to fund climate change denial and to delay any progress that we might have. Um, we have seen the same thing with the NRA and with guns. And I think it is important for us to recognize that there are industries that have been obstructionists and that we have invited to many tables and that that has been to our great peril and to pulling things backwards. So while I do absolutely support the idea of us trying to find broad coalitions and build those broad coalitions, particularly of communities that are most impacted, I think it is also important for us to be clear-eyed about who we also have to be wary about inviting to the table. And I really just want to finally end with one thing that just says that we, do, we have seen the last 50 years um, a very concerted proposal and plan to move the center of the country farther to the right. And I think one of the things that we've seen, and that's been sort of described as kind of trickle-down economics, many of the sort of the neoliberal economic experiment, and what that has produced is it turned millionaires into billionaires and it has turned the working people into the working poor. We have to acknowledge these are the realities we're dealing with right now. And when we think about what it takes for people to vote, it is absolutely that belief that their vote makes a difference. It is absolutely some ease um, of being able to register to vote but it is also that belief and understanding that they have the time to invest in making sure that their vote is heard, making sure that they can talk to their neighbors, making sure they understand the issues. When people are working two and three jobs just to put food on the table, they cannot fully participate in the democratic process. So I just want us to think about some of those hindrances and cautionary tales about what it means to pull everyone together. I almost wore my witch hat today for Halloween. <laughs> and, and I was thinking to myself, because I'm a little over literal, I was like, you know, we don't, we don't, we no longer invite, you know, the people who believe in burning witches to the table, you know. Sometimes we have to say there are some things that were beliefs of some folks that we don't necessarily need to have to have a healthy democracy. You're making an important distinction between having a right to something and having access to something, and that, that is meaningful distinct. I do wanna um, open it up, so I'm gonna ask you all really quickly for a moment of hope. Can you give me an example from your work that gives you a signal and hope and inspiration that democracy, renovation, mm -hmm. revival, reconstruction is possible and that philanthropy can play a meaningful role in it? Sarah, let's start with you, and then Stephen, and then Crystal will bring us home. 
Yeah, this will be easy for me because I've already touched on a lot of it. So uh, the reason we were so connected to that work on American culture is because we're, we're building towards a mass activation effort uh, around America's 250th, uh, the anniversary of the, the founding of the Declaration of, of Independence. And, and uh, in looking at American appetites and how they're defining the American dream, we found that, that common ground and we found um, a, a really strong ability to move people from this, this place of burn it all down populist resentment to a desire to contribute constructively in community. And it can be as simple as an act of civics or act of service that transforms people from that zero sum place to that abundant place. So imagine something like 250 million acts of civics or acts of service for the 250th anniversary. That's not that long from now. We and, and others in philanthropy can catalyze that kind of involvement, get Americans back on the playing field, and I think you'll see tremendous difference. Stephen? So I want to connect my comment to what Crystal was just saying, because I, I really agree with Crystal. And um, as some of you may know, I, in an earlier stage in my life, I was the founding president of Demos, and Demos was founded precisely because of economic and political inequality and the connection between the two in America. So I absolutely agree that that's a fundamental flaw in where this country is, but I also want to tell our story, Sarah, if you don't mind, absolutely. because I think it's an interesting example. Um, I obviously am the CEO of what is known to be a, a very progressive foundation, and Sarah comes from a foundation that is assumed to be a very right of center uh, philanthropic institution and structure. And when I first um, started getting to know Sarah and her colleagues at Stand Together, there were a lot of people who challenged me in doing so. And I didn't want to make any assumptions at the outset. I was not going into it blind. I had read, you know, the, the really powerful book called Democracy and Change, which is highly critical of the industries and the company that was founded by the founders of Stand Together. But nevertheless, I just thought, you know, there's, there's got to be something here. And we started talking to each other and just built a set of personal relationships around the challenges to our democracy. And since then, we are now in a philanthropic collaborative to build something called the Trust for Civic Infrastructure, which was one of the 31 recommendations in our common purpose. And Stand Together and RBF, along with the Packard Foundation, and the Carnegie Corporation of New York and the Omidyar Network together in a, what is a pretty diverse philanthropic collaboration are the founding donors to create a national vehicle to support communities working to build civic infrastructure across lines of difference ideologically and lines of difference across ethnicity and race and age and whatever else there might be. In communities where there is the spirit and hope for democracy, but they lack the resources, they lack the connections to others, they lack the community to help them accomplish that. And we have learned, I have learned, an enormous amount by working with Sarah on this. And I will say there were some people at the Rockefeller Brothers Fund who really challenged me and thought that I was consorting with the enemy. <laughs> and in fact, what I've been doing is consorting with a friend. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I really uh, do believe in the power of personal relationships to create transformative change. Um, and I also think that one of the key uh, ideas that I think that you've touched on, Stephen, and what I've seen um, be successful is, is less bringing people together to try to find commonality and more going to people and organizing around the issues that are causing them challenge and pain in their lives. So I'll just give one example of an organization, um, uh, um, Olay, which is um, organizing in the land of enchantment uh, in New Mexico, which is an incredible organization that is uh, doing an, uh, a lot of organizing work with folks who are just everyday working class people and asking them what the issues were in their community and what is happening in their um, neighborhoods. And people really talked a lot about not being able to afford childcare. 
And you know, there really was no mandate, there was no legislative support for this. They had a legislator, legislation that didn't really support the issues. But they kept organizing and organizing and organizing, and they have actually secured a right to child care and um, early childhood education in the state of New Mexico by organizing and organizing and organizing. So I think one of the things that really does come to my mind is that it's important for us as funders, um, uh, and I know Heising Simons is here, and Liz Simons was one of the first people to fund um, Olay and you know, give them some of that early support and has been funding them for over a decade. I think that's the kind of really um, powerful support that philanthropy can provide when we're going out and funding people to meet people where they are and to understand what their issues are and to come together to solve those issues. I think that's really powerful. Great. Let's take a couple questions. Let's take two back to back and then you can respond to them together. I can't see. Anybody? I've got one here. Oh, we've got one right here. I don't know if, oh, and there's a microphone over there. Okay. Let's go here, and then if somebody else doesn't already have the mic, let's bring one to, to this gentleman here. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much. This was really wonderful. Um, Luke with the Ford Foundation. Um, as someone you know, who funds globally, and I personally didn't grow up here, I grew up in Brazil, um, very young democracy, going through a lot of actually similar challenges to here. Um, I'm curious um, what lessons you think we can learn from other either older democracies in Europe or younger democracies in um, Asia and, and Latin America, uh, you know, lessons that we can apply to, uh, to the same moment in time right now. Great, go ahead. And right here. Thanks all for a fascinating discussion. Um, I wanna pick up on what you kept talking about, Crystal, which is this paradox of tolerance and sort of using exclusion as a tool. I'm really fascinated by this idea. I think especially because the greatest weakness of democracy is that we can choose to stop being one, but we can't choose to start being one again. So I'm wondering how you see exclusion as a, as a tool that can be used for good. I imagine there's also some intersections in these <laughs> questions, um, especially from the international peace building communities about the connections between um, lessons from international democracy efforts and the paradox of tolerance. Crystal, since that one was directed to you, do you wanna go first and then we'll have others weigh in? Yeah, and I do think there are some connections there. Um, I, I think that what I um, hope that I'm communicating is that I'm less interested in this question of excluding and more interested in the connection of who are we moving towards? Who are we leaning into? What are the communities where we say, this is where I wanna put my energy, right? We spend in philanthropy, I think, a lot of time trying to create a broad table of other philanthropists who frankly are very similar to us. What we really wanna do is come together as communities and lean into that. I think one of the things I want to think about in terms of, you know, that we're learning from a lot of our work at the Libra Foundation is the lessons that we can learn about democracy from other countries are really important warnings. One of the things that we do is we fund a lot of gender justice work. And one of the early warning signs of a state, of a democracy failing and moving into autocracy is um, the real undermining of gender rights. So we know this is one of the fundamental foundational things that both autocrats and far religious um, fundamentalist organizations do is they create, they, they oppress women's rights, their autonomy to their bodily decision making. They create very clear binaries around gender. Um, and that's something that we're seeing happening in this country right now. So that's a very big cautionary tale that we, we can learn from other um, countries. The other thing that we learn is the free-flowing access to um, weapons is also another real warning point about the beginning of sliding into an autocracy. And this is something that's really important because generally speaking what happens is, is our mental frame is that mass shootings and horrible violent acts are independent acts. That's, the, that's our mental frame. It's like, oh, this was a tragedy that just happened in Maine. There was a tragedy that happened in Uvalde. These are these separate things. What, what our minds are not actually 
uh, built for is to understand when these things are compounding and growing and the space between them is lessening. And that's actually what's happening right now. Hate crimes are dramatically on the rise in this country. Um, access to high volume uh, weapons, easily accessible in this country. So we're starting to see some of the warning signs from other countries that we need to be paying attention to about the loss of democracy and the sliding into autocracy. Danielle, do you want to jump in on this? Sure, I will. Thank you. Um, and just I want to thank everybody for this extraordinary conversation. I mean, I appreciate the honesty of it and everybody's thinking hard about the moment we're in, um, where the clock of the world is right now, I think, as you said, Crystal. Um, so first of all, lessons from elsewhere. Um, I meant it when I said we needed to do de-radicalization work in this country. This speaks to the issue of a culture of violence uh, as well in the country. Um, de-radicalization work is work that many of our international facing organizations know how to do well, that we've never brought that expertise and understanding here to home. Um, but we do actually need to. And um, in addition, um, I mean, it's also important that among you know, Brazil, India, the US, you see three huge democracies, all seeking to be multicultural or multiracial democracies, right? You know, ain't never been seen before in world history to pull this off. So it's important that we all understand that we're working on a really big, hard, worthy project. Um, and in that regard, yes, we should absolutely be having kind of community of conversation across those spaces because we're all trying to learn this at the same time. Um, so and the last thing I want to say is just because I really appreciate this conversation and Crystal, the way you're, you're pushing everybody and, um, and you invited us, Kristen, to, to, to surface disagreements. And so I think we've, we've got a little bit of a disagreement here and I just I want to go ahead and think out loud about it because I think this is exactly the hardest thing, right? So for me, I'm just gonna use oil and gas as an example, kind of concrete example. I am at a place where I actually, I want to be able to solve our climate issues through the institutions of a, a free and equal society of self-governing citizens, I say through a democracy. I don't want to have to solve climate issues while living in some other form of mm -hmm. government. Yeah. And yeah. so for me, I am actually willing to be at the table with oil and gas and to do work on democracy. Um, because I do actually think that the democracy issues are so pressing and so urgent and that that what is at stake is really, you know, will sort of institutions of free self-government persist on this earth or not? Um, I understand you're saying, will the earth persist or not? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so fair enough. Reasonable. All right, I guess. Okay, that is also a very urgent <coughs> perspective. Uh, yes. And I do get yes. that. Yes. Um, but again, like, you know, we have to solve our problems. We have to have structures for solving them. And right now, the prospect of the long-term existence of healthy democracy know, is diminishing, mm -hmm. I don't want to lose that as our method for problem solving. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. We are out of time, Oops. so I want to invite everyone, I'm going to ask you to give me five words. I want you to intentionally leave people hanging so that they swarm the stage afterwards because they want to hear more <laughs> about it from you. Five words, what is something that you think could impact our ability to renovate democracy, whether positively or negatively? that you suspect people here either don't understand, are completely underestimating, or cannot even possibly see coming? Five words. <laughs> I, I have three words. Okay. I give in. <laughs> no! <laughs> no, no, no. That's an impossible question. It's you give in, question. just kidding. I'll take one of your words and answer <laughs> <laughs> I feed my words. <laughs> Mine is, I mean, I, this doesn't actually really feel like a teaser, but like, educate people about ending party primaries. Mm. Okay. okay. Uh, my, um. my serious answer is, and, and it's not going to be that provocative, but I, but I think it's important no, nonetheless, democracy is our common purpose. Mm. Mm. Five words. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to count the words. Uh, work with anyone to do good and no one to do harm. I don't, uh, fund multiracial, 
power building organizing. That's good. <laughs> Thank you all so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.